Good morning. morning. Guys are enthusiastic and awake. There is coffee available in the lobby, I can tell. (laughs) Imagine if I drank coffee, the cameraman would be like, the whole time. (laughs) Poor David this morning. I think they cast lots to see who doesn't get to do the camera. (laughs) Uh, If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor, and it has been said of me that I had a very strict upbringing. When younger people hear my story, they often say, wow, your parents were really strict. But when older people than me hear my story, they say, that's nothing. And it does seem that Successive generations, for them, it gets easier and easier for each generation. Now, by default, maybe it's not their fault, technology makes life easier. So it's kind of a theme. But it does seem as if parents do play a part sometimes. Even the age gap between me and my sister, just a few years younger than me, It seemed to me, in my opinion, that she was spoiled. My parents went easy on her. Maybe, if I'm being honest this morning, I was a little jealous. It seemed like she got more stuff than me, and she didn't have to earn it. But what really bothered me is what seemed like a lack of gratitude for what she had. It seems like that. And so certain stories, movies, books, if you will, would resonate with me. One of them was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the Willy Wonka movie. Now, I'm going to say this. It's going to make some people my age and older a little mad. But this is one sequel, or what is it called there, a remake, that I think is better. I think the new one is better than the old one. I know. Sacrilege right now. Some have said it's closer to the book. It's Tim Burton, wacky movies. I think it's pretty cool. It's a good remake. But the basic premise is that Willy Wonka is this really eccentric guy. He has a chocolate factory everybody wants to get into. They can't. He won't let him in. He's mad about something that happened to him. He's built up all these resentments. He's not seeing anybody about it. Anyway, well, actually, he is in the new movie, in Oompa Loompa. (laughs) Kind of funny. Anyway, he decides, I'm going to get five golden tickets. Five lucky people can come in and take a tour of the factory. And he puts them in the Wonka bars and distributes them. Now... Most of the kids aren't playing fair. They're cheating to get the golden tickets. Their parents are spoiling them. So one parent buys like tons and tons and tons of cases and then employs people to open them all up. That kid gets the golden ticket and so on and so forth, except one, except Charlie. He does it the right way. After a couple of tries, he goes to the store, he buys one, he gets the golden ticket. Very appreciative. They take the tour and well, You guessed it, the spoiled kids stay spoiled. They want more. 
It's not enough for them. They've got the golden ticket. It's not enough. But it is for Charlie. And so he passes the test. Now, funny things happen to the spoiled kids, right? Like Veruca Salt. I think in the old one, it's the golden egg she goes after. But in the new one, she goes after a squirrel. It's not enough for her that she has a horse and all these other animals. It reminds me of my sister. <laughs> She wants more. She goes after the squirrel, and then she gets tossed down the garbage chute. Her dad goes after her. Now, if we're being honest, I didn't feel bad for them. I kind of thought it was funny. They got what they deserved. Interesting. Lack of gratitude. It seems that when kids don't have to earn something, they don't always appreciate it. It seems that. So we're seeing that in the rest of the story. The Israelites, they have a lack of gratitude. They're always complaining, and they want more all the time. And bad stuff happens to them. And if we're being honest, I think we can say it's hard to feel sorry for them sometimes. Pattern will continue. Today we'll be focusing on the parts of the law that deal mainly with the priests, the priestly duties. We're going to land today in Leviticus. We left off at the Ten Commandments. So we saw that Moses got the stone tablets, broke them, and then in Exodus 34, he gets the new tablets. So we're going to pick up at Exodus 35 this morning. There's a key figure here that shifts a little bit from Moses to a guy named Bezalel. Really interesting. He has a, an associate, a servant, an assistant named Aholiab. But it says of Bezalel that he's filled with the Spirit. And I described this to you guys. Acts, when we saw in the book of Acts, that is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But in the Old Testament, we see it right from the second verse, right in the beginning. The Holy Spirit is present for selected purposes, certain people. And Bezalel is one of these guys. Exodus 35, 30 says, Then Moses told the people of Israel, The Lord has specifically chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, grandson of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Interesting. Jesus' tribe, by the way. So we see something else, too. He's charged with making all this stuff, the tabernacle, the priestly garments. And we see something happens. They need materials for this. And the people begin giving really generously. This is a foreshadowing of what we see in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit gives lots of different gifts. And probably the most overlooked gift is the gift of generosity in the book of Acts. Extreme generosity. And so this is a foreshadowing of that. Remember God's glory on Mount Sinai. It appeared on Mount Sinai. Now the tabernacle will be built and God will rest there in the form of like a cloud or smoke still. We get to the end of Exodus, so it's five chapters there, and at last Moses, or Bezalel too, they finish the work. Exodus 40, 33, then he hung the curtains forming the courtyard around the tabernacle. So this is like the portable church. It's like set up church. We don't do that. <laughs> and he set up the curtain at the entrance of the courtyard. So at last, Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled down over it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out on their journey following it. But if the cloud did not rise, they remained where they were until it lifted. The cloud of the Lord hovered over the tabernacle during the day, and at night fire glowed inside the cloud so the whole family of Israel could see it. This continued throughout all their journeys. Now, we end up at Leviticus. And some of you who've been in church for a long time are thinking, get me a pillow. <laughs> <laughs> it gets long. It seems very, very daunting. But we're going to look at the rest of the story this morning and see how it connects all the way almost-ish to the end of the Bible. Now, interesting, fun fact. We're going to learn a lot of those this morning. The name comes from the Greek version of the tribe of Levi. So we're seeing a little theme here. If you're new, go back to the beginning of the series. You can watch the intro. They're in a Greek-speaking world in the time of the New Testament. 
And there's a Greek version of the Old Testament then. But here, the book of Leviticus concerns itself primarily with priestly laws. Not all of it, but primarily with priestly laws laws. And it's very interesting. We're getting to a point where we're learning that these biblical books are not proportionate to the time that's gone by. Right? So it's not like each chapter's a month or something like that. So from the Passover-ish, roughly, through the rest of Exodus, then through the entire book of Leviticus, then into Numbers, chapter 13, 14, it's about one year. Then, from Numbers 14, all the way through the rest of Numbers, through Deuteronomy, 40 years. So it's interesting. So it's a very short span of time, and that's what makes Leviticus daunting, is because there are lots of details. About Exodus 35, people quit. They're like, oh gosh, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, it's all these little details. They're kind of important. I encourage you to read through it. If you don't like reading, you can listen. You can use certain apps and just listen to it. That's how they learned, through hearing. So the book does contain mostly laws, but there are two memorable stories in the book of Leviticus, and that's what makes it kind of tough, because as I said before, normally when you're reading a book of the Bible, especially in the Torah, that is the first five books of the Bible, you'll get like a story here and there, and then some laws, and a story, and some laws, and a story, and some laws. Genesis is just packed with stories, so it's kind of easy to remember, it's easy to read. Leviticus hard, but the two stories are kind of important. The first one, we ran into these guys, if you were paying attention, last week. Remember that certain people could go up a certain distance on the mountain. Only Moses went all the way up. And there's one point at which they have the 70 elders, and they have this covenant meal in the presence of God. It's really beautiful there. Along with them are Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu. These are Aaron's first two kids, Moses' nephews. Well, if we get to Leviticus 9, there's like this initiation of the priesthood. So they're purified, they're ready for the ministry. And at the end of that chapter, it says that fire from the Lord bursts out from the tabernacle. This is the fire that they're supposed to use to burn certain offerings. Very important. That fire from God. Well, we get to chapter 10, and Nadab and Abihu, they're working in the priestly ministry, right? They're Aaron's sons. They decide, for whatever reason, to use a different kind of fire to burn the offerings. Now, a lot of commentaries on this. I don't like to speculate too much. Maybe they have fire and incense to cover the presence of the Lord. Maybe the intentions were good. Maybe they were bad. Maybe they were taking the fire of the Lord for granted. So, they get burned up. Uh-oh. If we keep reading, Numbers 2, or Numbers 3, says what happens. 3-2, the names of Aaron's sons were Nadab, the oldest, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. So those are their replacements. These sons of Aaron were anointed and ordained to minister as priests, but Nadab and Abihu died in the Lord's presence in the wilderness of Sinai when they burned before the Lord the wrong kind of fire. Strange fire, because it's not supposed to be there. Different than he commanded. Since they had no sons, this left only Eleazar and Ithamar to serve as priests with their father, Aaron, this story is mostly told to highlight obedience, doing what the Lord says, no matter what you think about it. So they're kind of like those bad employees that we talked about last week. But what if, or I want to do it this way, or I want to do it that way. It's told a lot, so we're going to kind of breeze over it. The next one shows how important another one of the Ten Commandments is. We talked about the Sabbath last week. Really important. That's highlighted a lot in the Old Testament. And the penalty for breaking it is death. Well, there's another one here, more than that. But we see this story. We get to chapter Leviticus 24, I believe. And we see the story of a man who gets into a fight with someone. Gets angry, and he takes the name of the Lord in vain. Shalometh is her, his mother's name, doesn't give us the father's name or his name, just says the mother's an Israelite, dad's an Egyptian. So they detain him. People hear it and detain him. 
Moses consults the Lord, what do I do? Stone him to death. Kill him. Glad we're not following the Old Testament laws anymore, right? There'd be nobody here. <laughs> so it's interesting, before they do this, they do something very interesting that you need to pay attention to. They lay hands on him. What's that about? In the church today, we usually associate that with introducing someone into ministry. You lay hands on someone, you pray, something like that. You pray for them. Here, it has a different purpose. He's probably defiled the community with this sin. So they're transferring the sin back into him and then killing him. Kind of interesting. We see this when priests make sacrifices to atone for people. They'll lay hands on, pe on the animal and transfer the sin into that animal. And then they do different things with the animal. So very briefly, a lot of people don't understand this idea of atonement for sin. So they'd have animal sacrifices in the general broad picture. If you're not understanding it, that's weird. Yes, it seems weird to us. The general idea is that the animal will take your place. You've sinned. You deserve to die. The animal takes your place. And sometimes the sins get transferred in the animal and shed the blood that you should be shedding. And the priests do different things with the blood. That's the basic idea. Now here we get to something very important. If we hop into the middle-ish of the book of Leviticus, we see a very important day initiated. Leviticus 16.1. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of Aaron's two sons who died after they entered the Lord's presence and burned the wrong kind of fire before him. The Lord said to Moses, warn your brother Aaron not to enter the most holy place behind the inner curtain whenever he chooses. It's going to be just once a year. If he does, he will die. For the ark's cover, the place of atonement, is there. And I myself am present in the cloud above the atonement cover. So what we're seeing here is the initiation of the Day of Atonement. Now, I don't know about down here, but up north, maybe you got the day off of school on Yom Kippur. Did that happen? Yom Kippur? I think I got the day off of school. So, Day, Yom Kippur, of Atonement. That's what it means. And it's kind of this corporate forgiveness ceremony that the Jewish people would do. Very, very, very important. So the high priest, he would purify himself He'd sacrifice a bull for himself, cleanse himself. He actually washes himself, a prefiguring of baptism. He clothes himself with linen garments. This is so he doesn't sweat and defile anything. Then he will sacrifice a goat for the people. But something kind of interesting happens. It's a little different. So let's take a look at it. Leviticus 16.6, Aaron will present his own bull as a sin offering to purify himself and his family, making them right with the Lord. Then he must take the two male goats that he chooses and present them to the Lord at the entrance of the tabernacle. He is to cast sacred lots to determine which goat will be reserved as an offering to the Lord, like the camera people, to decide who... Well, here we go. We're going to have, a, not going to, which will carry the sins to the people uh, to the wilderness of Azazel. That's weird. Some Bibles don't say that. I'll explain it to you. Aaron will then present as a sin offering the goat chosen by Lot for the Lord. That's the one that gets sacrificed, the cameraman. The other goat, the scapegoat, Chosen by Lot to be sent away will be kept alive standing before the Lord. When it is sent away to Azazel in the wilderness, the people will be purified <clears throat> and made right with the Lord. Now, if you notice something, you're paying attention, you know the English language well. I kind of did it backwards, didn't I? It's interesting. The scapegoat. Is that the person who takes the blame for something? Hmm. But this is really weird, isn't it? It's probably because scapegoat is not Really a good word for that when we're thinking about it rightly. One is sacrificed. The other one gets sent away to Azazel or Azazel. What's that? Well, this is interesting. I'm using an NLT because it's easy to understand. It's not exactly known as the most precise version, but here is an example of them getting something right. 
when a lot of really like literal versions get it wrong. In fact, they have to jumble up the words sometimes to make it make sense. I'll explain it to you. So here's an example where we have to jump outside of the biblical text to understand something. We have to jump to the book of Enoch. Now, sometimes in the Protestant church, that's a bad word. <laughs> we can't look at that. Well, they're talking about that here, so we might want to look at it. Now, if you're new, Enoch came up before, a long while ago. Maybe you weren't paying attention. Genesis 5.21. When Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. After the birth of Methuselah, Enoch lived in close fellowship with God for another 300 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Enoch lived 365 years walking in close fellowship with God. Then one day, he disappeared because God took him. Now, he walked in close fellowship. God thought him of him as righteous. Sounds a lot like Noah, who, who God carried away to safety too, just in a different way. There's only a couple people, to my recollection, that are taken up like this. Him and Elijah, they're taken up like that. Very interesting. Now, he is Noah's great-grandfather. That's the connection here. Now, if we keep reading to Genesis chapter 6, we see the beginning of the flood account. It's where Noah comes in. And there's a reason for it. It's because the sons of God or angels of God, our, they're having intercourse with the daughters of men. Kids around, I don't know. So anyway, you get the point. And it just says, if you read Genesis 6, God does not like this. And this is why the flood happens. That's basically all the information we really get. Maybe they create giants, depending on how it's translated. That's it. But if we go to Enoch, we get a further explanation. You see, the angels are named. They have all these different names. They're causing trouble. They're showing mankind how to do all these really bad things, like sorcery, sexual practices, all kinds of crazy stuff. One of them, in particular, is teaching them how to make weapons for war. They're making the people bad. They're these fallen, evil kind of angels. The name of one of them is Azazel. Interesting. So, we put this together. He gets banished, and he gets sent out into the wilderness. So he's bound. The Lord has him bound. I think Raphael is the angel in charge of having him bound and sent off into the wilderness. There's other good angels, too, like Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, Donatello. Ninja Turtles are not in the Old Testament. <laughs> They're in the New Testament. So anyway, <laughs> so there's this other goat. And what happens is, is Aaron transfers the sin of the people corporately into this goat. And it is sent out to the wilderness, to Azazel, to the wilderness. So it's seen as not a sacrifice to him or to appease him. No, it's like a garbage can of sin sent back out to where it belongs. Then the other goat is killed. And that is the rest of the story a lot of people don't get. Now, I've seen a lot of people brush this aside, despite the fact it's all over early Jewish writings. This is the belief then. But it's an example of the rest of the story. And it is, in our Bibles, in part, it's hard to catch. You see, the apostles believed this to be a true account, what I just told you about Enoch, and I'll show you the proof of it. It is a part of Scripture, very interestingly. If you go to the second last, to last book of the Bible, Jude, Jude is really about false teachers. He wants to write about other things, but there's all these false teachers around, so he's got to concentrate on that. And so he uses examples from apocryphal books, two of them. The Assumption of Moses and the Book of Enoch, quoting them directly. Jude 1.14, Enoch, 
who lived in the seventh generation after Adam, prophesied about these people, false teachers. He said, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on the people of the world. He will convict every person of all the ungodly things they have done and for all the insults that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That's a quote. But that quote is found nowhere in the Old Testament. Most of the time they're quoting Old Testament verses. It's not there. Weird. It is a direct quote of the book of Enoch, chapter 1, verse 9. This is remarkable. You don't hear about this an awful lot. Think about it. Jude, by the power of the Holy Spirit, is writing God's word. This is the word of God. If you asked any very conservative uh, Protestant, are these lines, these verses in the book of Jude scripture? It's a yes. Well, that's interesting because it's a quote from the book of Enoch, which might, we have a Baptist, former Baptist pastor back there, <laughs> which makes these verses scripture. That's something to consider. Now, it's interesting, but you should know that Enoch is not usually in any Christian canon. There are very few denominations that put that book in there. But the Holy Spirit decided to put those verses from it in there. And Jude is quoting it as if it happened. He's not saying, well, it is said that, or like this example from Enoch. No. He's saying that those things really happened. Remarkable. So it teaches us to open our minds just a little bit. Or not. Whatever. Now, there's another part in Leviticus, if we hop back there, and we keep reading to 17, that is quite interesting. Most people never catch this, the rest of the story. It's concerned with not sacrificing things outside the camp. Don't do it outside the camp. Don't do it outside the tabernacle. No bueno. Why? Leviticus 17.7, the people must no longer be unfaithful to the Lord by offering sacrifices to the goat idols. Demons, some versions say. This is a permanent law for them to be observed from generation to generation. So we see a confirmed belief there. The goat demons or goat idols, they're always in the wilderness. Think about it. Jesus was tempted by Satan where? In the wilderness. So it's where all the bad spirits live. And again, Azazel is probably more like a garbage can of sin. We're going to send, send the sin back to where it started from, not a sacrifice to him. That's not what I'm saying. Now, these are very interesting things. But they're no longer necessary because they're all fulfilled in Christ. Now, I've told you there are a lot of commentaries and when I look at certain commentaries, depending on what denomination sponsored them, they say different things. And so, if you know me, you know I like to read a lot of them. I like to get the full picture and then look for common denominators and look for more facts and study history. But the best commentary we have on the Old Testament is the New Testament. And so let's go there to Hebrews and take a look at what it says about this atonement in the Old Testament. I'll let God do some of the talking now. Hebrews 9, starting at verse 1. That first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on earth. There were two rooms in that tabernacle. In the first room were a lampstand, a table, and sacred loaves of bread on the table. This room was called the holy place. Then there was a curtain, and behind the curtain was the second room called the Most Holy Place. In that room were a gold incense altar and a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant, which was covered with gold on all sides. In the Ark were a gold jar containing manna, we're going to look at that next week, Aaron's staff that sprouted leaves, and the stone tablets of the covenant. These were the ones that were replaced, the Ten Commandments on them. Above the ark were the cherubim of divine glory, whose wings stretched out over the ark's cover, the place of atonement. But we cannot explain these things in detail now. When these things were all in place, the priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place. That's Aaron back then. And only once a year, as I told you guys. 
And he always offered blood for his own sins and the sins the people had committed in ignorance. But these regulations, by these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. This is an illustration pointing to the present time. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the consciences of the people who bring them. For that old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies, physical regulations that were in effect only until a better system could be established. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not a part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of bulls, calves, goats, he entered the most holy place once and for all time. He and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think of how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For the, by the power of his eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. Jesus fulfills it all. He is both high priest and perfect sacrifice. He is the once and for all sacrifice, not the yearly one any longer. Hallelujah! Dan. The Israelites were ungrateful. They needed sacrifices over and over. But now Jesus is the once and for all perfect sacrifice. If we keep reading, Hebrews 10 says this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. We now have access to God. We are now a family of priests under the great high priest, Jesus. But it isn't so that we can keep sinning. Peter talks about those who have rejected Jesus for this world. First Peter, verse 2, they stumble because they do not obey God's word. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you are not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Did you know that in the original version of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Veruca Salt was a bad nut. She was set for the incinerator. She was going down that tube to be burned. I think the new version says that too. Interesting. You see, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory can be seen as a picture of heaven and hell. Where does Charlie go? He ascends in the elevator. Veruca is sent to be burned in the fire like Nadab and Abihu. Like that story, the New Testament teaches us over and over and over again that our behavior matters. It's not taught a whole lot. Our attitude matters. It counts for something. You see, the author of Hebrews, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Continues, yes, we are covered by Jesus' blood. But check this out. If we keep reading, it says this, not popular verses. Hebrews 10, 26, dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. Think about it. Let me read it to you again. Now, remember this. I've dropped it right into its context. 
Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant, which made us holy as if it were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. Like the scapegoat thing. Right? You've heard that story. Ah, gets away. It does the opposite that most Christians believe. Right? Jesus died for me, covered me in his blood. I can do whatever I want. That's the basic sentiment. Right? The word of God says it's the opposite. Jesus is the great sacrifice, the great high priest. How much more appreciative Should we be for that? Then something common happens every year. It happened once. That's it. We should be that much more appreciative of Jesus' holy and perfect sacrifice. And that should fill us with an attitude of gratitude. You see, Jesus is the golden ticket, so to speak. We Christians, if we are in Christ, we have the golden ticket. Think about it. But how are we acting? How are we responding to that prize? Hmm? Are we asking for more? Or are we like Charlie? Are we grateful for it? Has it produced in us an attitude of gratitude? Now, we've received the prize but not by anything we've done. Let me be clear about that. I'm not talking about doing good works. I'm talking about a response to the work that was done for us. That gift of grace should lead to gratitude. And our gratitude should lead to right living. We looked at Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and I told you Peter gave a short speech, a short sermon in response to what the people were saying about them. Talked about Joel, he quoted that in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Right after that, he tells us how the Spirit is received. Acts 2.38, each of you must repent. If you don't know what that means, it sounds scary, church word. It means change, turn from what you've been doing. Each of you must. Not like if you kind of want, you might want to think about repenting. And this is like a seven-year process. No! Repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Then, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repentance, change, precedes baptism. It comes before it. Change is required in coming to Jesus. He himself demands it over and over again. In other words, your attitude matters. We must have knowledge of the truth and adopt the right attitude. The attitude of obedient children who are grateful for what Christ has done for us. If we hop back to Peter, 1 Peter 1.14, so you must, again, look at the word, must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but you do now. And so we must adopt An attitude that is reflective of what has been done for us. We shouldn't complain or demand more in light of what Jesus has done for us. We can't be chasing after these things of the world that are fading away anyway. We have to concentrate on the heavenly prize in Christ. If Christ is our prize, What more could we want? We must keep our eyes fixed on the heavenly prize. Colossians 3.1. 
Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden in Christ, with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. We must adopt the attitude of gratitude that fuels obedience. Gratitude that fuels joy. A joy that surpasses all that this world has to offer. An obedience which shows, proves that we love and belong to our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for everyone who took the time out to come here today. Your church, the body of Christ, not the building. I pray that you give them an attitude of gratitude, constantly remembering what Jesus has done for us in everything we do, even in our enemies. The least of these, we see Jesus, and we act accordingly. That our attitudes are reflective of what you've done for us, that we are just vehicles of your love, of the gospel, to spread the good news. Lord, we thank you. Fill us with your spirit. Empower us to do these things. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.